Okay, welcome to today's um, construction round table. We have an excellent panel of um, experts, guests, uh, speakers today. Uh, we're going to cover a number of construction topics in this, our first broadcast. Um, my name is Mark Wheeler, I'm the Chief Executive of Driver Group, and uh, I'll introduce, in fact, I'll ask the panel to introduce themselves. My name's Stephen Blakey, I'm Commercial Projects Director at Network Rail. I'm Anne Allen, I am the CEO of the Chartered Institute of Civil Engineering Surveyors. I'm Katie Holt, I'm the Development Manager at the Chartered Institution of Civil Engineering Surveyors. I'm Matthew Garrett, I'm a Commercial Director at Coste. Ronnie Klein, I'm an industry lawyer. Shai Jackson, I'm a construction lawyer at Brian K. Blayton Paisner. I'm Jim McCluskey, I'm a commercial leader with Finsey. As you can see, an esteemed panel of expert stroke legends in our industry. Um, we've got a number of things to talk about today. We're going to talk initially about this phrase that's been bandied about called building back better. Um, this has been used politically as almost as, as a kind of a slogan, really, post-pandemic. There are lots of challenges for our industry. But what does building back better actually, actually really mean? Um, and can I just ask you to give your thoughts on, on whether the uh, institution has considered that um, and, and what your thoughts are looking forward for the industry? So it, it's, it's an interesting phrase, um, probably a phrase which if you just take it in the sense of what it means as, as opposed to the political elements of it, um, as an industry we should continually be looking to improve what we do and therefore the idea that we always think about building back better um, is something that should be professionally something we're always looking at. I think though for me what that then allows to come into that is things like um, getting it right first time, you know, how we do that, how we use the digital technology to really enable us to build things better how we use new materials and new processes so that we're starting to build back and really deliver against the sustainability agenda. So for us as an institution, there's three golden threads that we currently look at um, as part of our strategy, and that's digital, sustainability, and equality and diversity. And if you, if you take those and you attach that to the phrase build back better, it means that we have a great workforce because they're diverse, it means that we're building the right things for the future and we're using technology to ensure that we're getting it right, um, we're addressing things like the circular economy and we're really creating infrastructures which serve the future needs of communities. So, great phrase and it's what we should all actually be asking for. Well, we've to got do. to turn it into some actions, that's, yeah. the, that's the key thing. Shai, what's the legal definition of building back? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, the legal answer is it all depends. <laughs> <laughs> you say that to every question I have. <laughs> it's the right answer. I, I, I think, as, from my perspective, it seems to me it means lessons learned. Yeah. It's something that the industry has not always been very good at doing. Um, we've had a lot of disruption, but it forced people to do things differently, and some of it was very good. I spoke to people who said, you know what, we had more difficult conditions, we found different and better ways of doing things, and I think it's about capturing that knowledge and using it as opposed to, like sometimes I think people do, and go through tough experience, improve perhaps, but then move on and start all over again. Certainly in, in our business, we, uh, a number of years ago, tried uh, to adopt a, a sort of Kaizen policy of continuous improvement. And perhaps this is an extension of continuous improvement, but with more of a step change. Um, certainly there are a number of people in our business who will tell you of their frustration when they bring along a particular document for my sign-off. And I say, because we have a policy, that particular document before it's published publicly, has to be demonstrably better than the last edition. And then everybody now knows that you don't come along and, and, and put it on the table without explaining why it's better. So I think that leadership is going to be critical at all levels in this build back better philosophy. So what's your take on that? Well, I think um, I agree with the context of iterative improvement, but actually building back better is a call to arms. Um, it, if you remember when it was published in March of 21, the context was, um, was COVID and a crisis 
and construction did a really good job in rallying around and dealing with that crisis. Um, and if you look at the approach to iterative improvements, you have perennial problems in the sector, in mainstream construction and in the niche sectors, and the iterative improvements are giving you a, a gradient that isn't steep enough. And Building Back Better was about, um, I agree with you absolutely, Anne, it was about predictability, it was about looking at productivity and value for money. Um, and, you, and bringing those three two things together where historically, through iterative improvements, there's been a very, very shallow improvement of productivity for UK construction. Predictability is erratic and stakeholder confidence and investment in construction uh, is mixed as a result of that because we get lots of high profile instances where things go wrong. Um, and value for money is erratic as well, for all sorts of reasons, some of which we, we, we touched on when we, when we had the, the um, commercial conference last year. So it is a catalyst to try and examine the key problems in, in the sector and deal with them differently. And some of the solutions that, 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 you, that you raised is about giving them emphasis, digitalization, of methods of construction, um, challenging the way that things are done and shifting to, uh, uh, to a new dynamic you know, to improve those things. I think also at the same time, there are new important criteria emerging that Building Back Better has taken advantage of or, or, or pointed to. That's everything from sustainability and the challenges to net zero and also then um, social value. So, so what you have is an opportunity through Building Back Better to take perennial problems and do more to fix them whilst at the same time bringing in some of the new sensibilities and values in the world that we live in around sustainability and social value. A lot of things in there to, to pick up on. One of the things um, I'm very conscious of is um, those that work in contracting are at the forefront of turning the talk that we talk into the walk. Um, how, how do you see, Matthew, that, that being converted into actions and the challenges uh, that exist in actually physically making that distant difference in real in real time. Yeah, yeah, we recognise the leadership role that we play, and I would echo what Stephen said. Um, it's not just now about efficiency, predictability. Um, we're coming back with new targets, new values around people and planet. Um, in regards to the planet, we know we've got to step up. We we, we can lead the march towards net zero, and we need to. And, and these are the sort of things that build back better means to us, as well as a whole new way of working that has been used during the lockdown around flexible working, use of technology. This is more and more important to the people, young people coming into the industry now that we can give them that way of working that is a, is a better balance to their work and career. A good point and clearly underlines also the scale of the challenge to, to the greater extent the industry is facing. Um, I'm tempted to ask Ruby what the real definition is legally of building back better, but I, I think... Um, you well, asked that question. <laughs> no, but the real, no, but the real, the real answer. What, what, what I'm thinking of, <laughs> what I'm thinking of in all seriousness is, is you, you've seen a lot of change, campaigned for a lot of change, moving forward as part of the, the industry building itself better over the next few years. What are the key, what are the key things you'd like to see happen? Are there any things that you, you know, you'd really like to see delivered over the next um, few years? You know, Mark, if I just, if I may, just take a step back, because um, as long as we've all been around, um, we've all talked about building that better. This is not a new idea, is it? I, I mean, I don't think the government will talk about it, actually, talk about it building back best and everybody. Um, but when you look over the years, that's a mantra that's been with us, or we perhaps haven't quite expressed it in the way, you know, uh, Stephen makes industry improvement, so he describes industry improvement, uh, without any clear idea what, what that is about. The truth of the matter is that we have a massively dysfunctional delivery system in construction. Absolutely dysfunctional. It cannot, cannot, it, it's not in a fit state to deliver anything of consequence in mind. The fact we managed to get out of buildings nonetheless, that sort of work to some extent is a miracle anyway, I've always felt. Um, but we are in a situation, I mean, you know, 
my learned friend here sees this all the time as well. Um, what I see in the work I, I do, I see um, uh, some of my clients are, are SMEs and the kind of stuff they, they give you, and you, you all know this, Mark, um, uh, Matthew, from years, years ago, because you, collect, you, you did a big collection of collect these contracts that you see from the dark ages, and they saw from the dark ages, where risk is simply, just simply passed down without the thought. There's, there's, there's nothing much about zero carbon in these contracts. Uh, um, there's nothing much about anything other than making sure that risk rests with those wholly and totally unable to, to uh, deal with it. Now, I, I mean, yes, was it yesterday or one of the days this week? Um, I was given a contract with a very small firm, um, and in it it said, um, retentions shall belong to the clients. So if the client went bust, as the private sector client went bust, then the, you, you'd lose your retention, even if there was money in the kitty. Um, things like that, because retention don't belong to the client, they legally belong to the party member they take. I'm just saying that because it's just a micro illustration of what we actually face. So we've got, um, uh, we always say this, and I've said it for years, we have mountains to climb. But that doesn't mean to say we shouldn't be there climbing. So, in a nutshell, Mark, uh, to me, it, it starts and ends with procurement. And what I'd like to see, I'd like to see we dump the way we traditionally procure a member completely if we can. I have been working for some years and I'm still very much involved with insurance backed alliance, where people are appointed at the outset to sign off risks, to sign off the design as a team um, and, and that the then with the client they work to make sure that the cost plan has got integrity. No cost plan has integrity because in fact it, it doesn't, it's not underpinned by any proper consideration of risk and where risk lies. Nobody wants to own risk. Uh, until we start acting, people start accepting what they want, yeah we, we want to own the risk, fine. But until we get there, we go nowhere. Uh, um, so the cost plan has got is not underpinned by any consideration about risk. So we've got to so totally unreliable. So I'd like to see a us moving toward not necessarily just that as a solution, but that's one solution. We've got three pilot projects. Now, given the fact that those projects could as a saving clients a lot of money, we can't even get the government on public bodies, let alone. Network, uh, sorry, uh, let alone uh, uh, a number of departments uh, and agencies to take up, the, even just a pilot, it, you know, give it a chance. So the cost plan, once the cost plan then is set, then the, ins the insurance company will underwrite the cost plan in respect of overruns, subject to an excess that's agreed uh, in pre agreed proportions uh, amongst the team. But that's it in a nutshell. So I'd like to see it moving towards. More team working, more collaboration. We talk about collaboration, but you know, that's a, again another problem. But but unless we are prepared to do that, um, then I really can't see significant progress. But we've got to work on it. We still got to continue to work on it. May, may I pick up on? Uh, I have feeling in my mind, and it's not that I I, I, I don't disagree um, uh, with with terrible phrase. I agree with much of what with, with what you say. Um, I think. Sorry, um, this is the good show, it's just No, 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 no. <laughs> this is, uh, um, I respect you hugely, and I value the contribution that you make in terms of the insight, but I think construction has always been a, a spectrum, and when you say we must climb the mountain, there are, there are lots of good things that are being done uh, to shift the dynamic, because the supply chain will go where clients take them, the clients lead, and, and many a client, particularly those that are departments of government, on their bodies like Network Rail, um, will also look to be progressive and go where governments want them to. And, and some of the progressive things, if you think about uh, uh, related, and it does make the field slightly complicated, but I can think of four things under the banner of, uh, of uh, building back better. We have the construction playbook that the Cabinet Office has, uh, has um, uh, released a couple of years ago which is, sets the expectations of what being a good progressive client are. We have, the, um, we have the government's procurement bill, which is looking at what good procurement should be. We have the public procurement green paper, and we just had recently published, um, you will have seen, um, uh, uh, constructing in the gold standard. 
And the key themes that run through all of those um, outputs are collaboration, early contractor involvement, um, sustainability, not just sustainability from a global perspective, but sustainability of the supply chain and making sure that there's liquidity, that there are returns, and that there is um, equality over the transfer of risk. And also, um, things such as Project 13 and other enterprise models that look to shift the dynamic away from linear transactional contracting and the passing of risk, which I know you'll be so familiar around, into communities of practice and organisations that are working together where the enemies aren't one another and, and inequitable passing of risk. The enemies are safety, time, value for money, cost and programme. And it's about how you manage those. And, and I think it's important just to convey that because it's not vanilla, it's not we're all saved, but I think at the other end of the spectrum, there are some laudable, genuine, potentially coherent things being done to shift us forward, and they sit with under that umbrella of building back better. So, Chair, yeah, can I come back on that? A bit? By, by all means, quickly. Very quickly, yeah. I, I mean, as I read uh, two or three years ago, 18 reports, I was a bit sad, because um, I took some of the read, 18 reports about construction, produced since October, of two year period, in October 2016. They all said very much what you're saying, say, and you couldn't gain say. The difficulty was, that nothing been implemented. The trouble is, if you're going to actually make a change, you're going to have specific initiatives, measures yep. that are um, in place, they need to be driven, they need to be implemented, then you have post-implement, appear for post-implementation um, uh, impact, and so on. None of this happens unless you have some overarching body, like you do in Singapore, for example, like the, you know, the building construction authority, overarching body that can take all of this, all of what you're saying, uh, uh, and uh, Matthew and others take all of that and make it happen and drive it, but it has to be a statutory body with, with proper authority, in, in my view. I think that um, having um, worked um, in China and on some projects <coughs> run by the Chinese contractors, there are a whole host of benefits to having uh, a state mandated situation. There are also, also some challenges that go with that. So perhaps we can look around the globe for some inspiration as to. What the pros and cons are of various system, uh, systems, and you, your thoughts? Yes, um, it, it's an interesting discussion, and I think the, what we actually are at is, is a cusp where we need a cultural change in the industry. So, at the moment, after the last however many years we've been building things, we've been building things in the same way, you know, for, for centuries. Um, the contracts have often been the same, and I was on a project project I was on before I came here, my the contract I had versus the contract that they'd used um, 120 years earlier to build the first phase of a campus. There were lots of similarities. And we've always rewarded people around the idea of fighting for the right money, making sure that you didn't take on the risk, making sure you pass the risk on to somebody else. You know, all the reward system. And all of us in this room have come up and grown up within that culture. Um, and for me, it's actually how you turn the whole industry on its head and how you start to reward for collaboration. You know, you should be splitting that reward. How, as a client, you teach the client to be able to articulate risk and take a share in that risk, but understand what that means financially. So, you know, they will have a budget, but they've got another budget by the side, which is their risk budget. But how, when you get the entire team, and I'm looking particularly at the cost and the contract managers, in a room, you, t you have the right conversations, not the conversations which simply protect the company you're representing. And that is going to take a long, long time, because that's a huge cultural shift. And the way we reward has to change in respect to that. And you know, I hope that for us as, some, as a professional body, we can start to provide some thought leadership into that. I think there's a huge role actually around digital, which will start to increase transparency around, you know, when you're making decisions, transparency around what you're actually building rather than the guys standing on the site going, oh yeah, we do not need to do it that way. And I think digital will help a lot with this, but we have to support and lead cultural change 
and that has to come through from the first day somebody steps on the site. So Jim, well, <clears throat> what happens do you think in the future, the first day someone steps on a site, so to take a, an approach to build back? <clears throat> um, well, to turn on to Rudy's point on, on alliancing, I think alliancing forms or uh, contracts can, can be very efficient in spreading the risk, spreading the responsibility uh, to, all, to all parties, as opposed to client taking some risk, contractor taking some risk. When it goes wrong, uh, relationships tend to get entrenched. So I think the alliancing model can work and does work in, in where all parties are, have got a, a stake. I think one of the things that's also really important from my perspective, hearing what everyone has said, is that we have um, the construction industry as an enormous whole. And then we have certain sectors of it that are very focused on doing things in an improved way, in a cutting edge way. Um, and equally, somewhere in that big mix of construction is the man with the van who goes to do the job and hopes to get paid at the end of the day. And they're all in this big mixing pot. And it's very easy to zoom in on rail contracts as we, as we might today, or to zoom in on house building or any other element, uh, major civils projects, um, and, and deal with them in a generalized way. But it's actually a very complex and nuanced marketplace. And I do know what Anne just said about technology because uh, I'll just share with you my experience of technology is that when it goes well, it can be fantastic. And when it goes wrong, it can be horrific. And people do tend to misuse technology and bless them because it keeps a number of our people really busy. But um, I'll give you an example, of, of uh, a very simple example of someone misusing technology. All of us and all of the people watching this uh, podcast will have used Teams over the last two years. Unless you live in a, in a cave in the Highlands somewhere, it's not possible to have got through life without the Teams experience. I know of a, of a project manager of my um, anonymous acquaintance who um, ran a project, a very complex project for about 12 months, having three or four hour meetings every two weeks. And towards the end of that period of time was asked a number of questions by me about what was agreed at these meetings at various stages. Now because he had pressed the record button on Teams for the meetings, he had about 50 hours of video, but no minutes. So now, to find the answers to those key questions I want, and I'm sure, Shai, you're going to tell me you've had some similar experiences as well, the, you know, the, the 100,000 emails on CD, done, that kind of stuff, where, in effect, he's got to watch 50 hours of video. Or if you might get lucky, you might be able to narrow that down to 10 hours. And then, the answer, I was told, was a bit more technology. We'll send it off to a technology firm who will work out a way to transcribe it. There comes a point where actually writing it down on a pad and then turning it into some minutes actually isn't necessarily old fashioned, it's just good practice. So, putting that thought out there, Matthew, technology, good thing, bad thing, or a bit of both? It's definitely a good thing, market is the future. And well, building a on weenie bit bad. <laughs> I've, even heard, I've even heard there's a bit of software you can deploy that will take the minutes in the meeting, publish them at the end of the meeting before anyone's ever left. And I like to work in the video. <laughs> <laughs> so listen, technology is the future. Um, we found out uh, how important it was during the pandemic. We all found new ways of communicating. We found ways of bringing resources and expertise into a room from miles away, regardless of where the geography is. And we've been able to deploy expertise at much lower cost for clients with smaller site establishments. And um, the big barrier for us now is to upskill the leaders so they can understand and implement the, the capa full capability of technology and not to just try and replicate existing systems with a digital solution but to think about how many different systems one digital solution can take out entirely. So the mental barrier, yeah. the, the leaders need to be upskilled, the people need to be upskilled uh, before we can really maximise the benefits of technology. Well, in my experience, uh, it's rare when it happens, but if you can find technology that simplifies rather than adds another layer of complexity, that's the secret. Um, uh, I'm not going to suggest this might be an age-related um, challenge, 
Well, Stephen does. Does, <laughs> does, 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 does a man of your of your youthful years <laughs> think that actually this the, the integration of better technology to help build back better is an opportunity for the next generation of leaders? I think I think I think it's to, uh, to, to, to lead the way. Literally. As a self-confessed light. Okay. Um, uh, uh, what is the opportunity that technology uh, creates? Uh, because yes, it is. It is a key opportunity, a key component of building back better. Um, and it's about freeing up time in the first instance and increasing the productivity. And I'm sure we're going to get time to talk about the resourcing challenge and demographics. Okay, it's taking out some of some indeed of the traditional things that have value and replacing them and making them quicker and easier. And that exchange was brilliant. Because what you what you described there was the dichotomy right. between doing it wrong, <laughs> between it being done wrong, yeah, which is different to it being the wrong thing to do. It was done wrong here, it was done right. Or what you're saying is there's a technical solution that allows you to do it right. And now you've got real time outputs. Everyone happy with that? Sign here, away you go. Um, and and that is I see that as an I see that as an opportunity. That's a fantastic opportunity. Um, I think that the the digital space is a dichotomy in, 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 a, number, in a number of ways. So I, I, I'll, I'll flag up something that I read recently, which would be dear to your heart, but I'm starting to see the phraseology of smart contracts now, where they're not just the administrative tools such as CMAR that give you prompts and, and, and nudge human beings to do things in a timely manner and make the mechanics of it easy, but now smart contracts that are saying, I think for, uh, the example I read was around understanding extreme weather provisions on NEC um, four contracts, and that would be a matter of fact. If you have the data that tells you that on that day there was a rainfall or a temperature variant that was outside of a 10-year norm, it is therefore, so, so that's easy. I mean, that's a, that's a great opportunity because it removes some of the dialogue, some of the opinion. It's a matter of fact, and, and a piece of technology says, nothing to worry about here. It's a matter of fact, and then these things fall into place. You always need the, the, the human aspect. The, the dichotomy um, uh, for me isn't so much around instances where digit digital technology isn't used correctly. It's around what it means for the value proposition of the intellectual offering of professionals. So if, if we just wind back a little bit, it wasn't that long ago that engineers, for example, spent a lot of time doing stuff to give you an output. And the output um, the value of that offering to clients was pretty much based on the input time taken to give you the output, the design, the calculations, you know, et cetera, et cetera. At the beginning of my, my career as a QS, the first thing I got to do was bar bending schedules. You know, okay? They told me there was no glamour in the profession. Um, it turned out they lied, but you know, it, was a, it was a sticky start. Um, and, and historically, a lot of the value and the price associated with professional advice has been on the input time to then provide an output, particularly in the, in the instances of design. Now let's scroll forward and you have a piece of technology that takes a five day activity and turns it into a three minute one. What, what does that present for clients and for the designers? Because in the first instance what that should allow is those resources now can be used on other things because the mechanics of calculations have been, have been automated. That's great, the outputs are, are, are automated. But for a client, there's now, the, there's now this dichotomy, which is, so if digital technology is making this really quick for you, it must make it cheaper for me. Surely that means that I'm only gonna pay one fifth of what I used to pay, um, i.e. one day. And actually now there's a, there's a value proposition because what you're offering up, what, what consultancies need to offer up is the intellect and the experience and the surety giving stakeholder confidence, and that is a value proposition that might in old money equate to four days, not one. And, and, and there's not enough, I don't think enough thought has gone into this at the moment in terms of clients' expectations of value in the market, and the, profession, the profession's ability to confirm the value irrespective of how long it takes to do the mechanics behind it. Well, I think it's a number of, of these technology issues um, issues like who owns the technology, who owns the data, where it sits. There's a lot of e legal issues. Um, I'm tempted to ask you about them, Shai, but I know you're going to tell me it depends. <laughs> <laughs> would, you, would you be prepared to put a little bit more colour on? Absolutely. 
there are different elements. I mean, first of all, I agree with Matthew. The technology is there. I'm sorry, Mark. We're not going to stop it. We're not going to make people go back to the old ways just because we're more comfortable That's with it. And like any technology, they've got the positive sides and negative sides. Overall, I think it will be better. I think I agree with that. A lot of it is about transparency. Because if you look at why do we have problems, some things are endemic, some of it is to do with projects being incredibly complex and people genuinely sometimes not knowing the real position. Yeah. And technology can help with that. And if you have more knowledge, which is objectively verifiable, just like the example about, then you'd like to think you'll have less to argue about and perhaps less issues, and that will lead to trust and confidence and all the good stuff. Um, but as you rightly said, the one thing I'm seeing is that procuring technology is very different from how we procured everything else, whether it's bricks and concrete, and you've got a mixing of a very different industry, the IT industry, which in some ways is very similar to construction. And some of the big IT projects have run into very similar problems because they're big, complex, lots of coordination, uh, client changes, all this sort of thing. But they are procured differently. And when you think about how you procure your work, your software, where you, know, you have to update it, you buy a monthly license as opposed to a one-off, that's very different. As you said, who owns it? We like to think, well, I have to pay for it, I own it. Well, it's not always the case with technology. Who takes the risk? Um, just to give an example, I've uh, worked as a contractor, kind of was doing all the traditional stuff, but also agreed to take responsibility, one of those um, risk allocation things, to a very complicated, cutting edge, but unfortunately still being developed, BMS system. And funny enough, everything was completed except for the system, which kind of 12 months after completion was still being played with and developed because that's how you work with the systems and they're always continuing. And if you're not aware of it, then it will create a new set of problems. So I think we need to understand that um, buying technology is very different from everything else that people have been buying before. Having, having spent many hours on hospital sites playing with BMS and trying to get it to work, find out where all the wires are going to, I sympathize with, with your client there. When it comes to technology, Jim, you're going to upgrade that iPhone, yeah? What, what, what do you think is the key thing to get right for, for the contractors in developing a bit more technology in their business? One of the key things for contractors is, as Matthew says, is upskilling the staff to operate the technology. Yeah. A lot of lost time is, is, is expended in people getting stuck on how to use a particular piece of software. I mean, these sort of things uh, in your daily business frustrate the progress of trying to get people's jobs done. Well, one of, one of the things that, that bugs me about technology a bit, and I sound terribly backward about this, I know, but when you do a lot of disputes, you see a lot of problems come through with technology. And I've seen calculations that were probably done in one day instead of five. And a little setting that's not been quite right in there. And then a whole thing has been constructed that then did not function uh, as, as intended, um, we, um, on the engineering team here, we've seen things that were not as air-conditioned as they needed to be. And actually, when you get to the end of a problem like that and it's identified, the cost of rectification is horrendous. So does this really come down to what you were saying about technology and the people, a skills gap, which is a topic that's important to touch on? Um, in terms of how an industry moves forward with um, specifying levels of skill and helping people at church attain higher ones, like speech. Um, and what role do you think that the institution has? Um, absolutely huge role. It's a conversation that we're having at the moment. You know, in terms of our competencies, how do we make sure that they're not just relevant for today, but actually they're helping members to move forward, um, we know that our members are actively employing data managers yeah. at the moment. Um, how do we make sure that we really enable them to become part of our profession and understand um, the profession as a whole? You know, you're a data manager, do you go to us? Do you go to a bank? Do you go to one of the, the big data companies? Um, I think what it means is that as an industry we're actually going to be competing in a very different workplace for people to join the industry. 
and we have to um, a develop in a way that makes us exciting and interesting we probably have to look at pay scales because you are competing with different industries so there's probably a challenge around that and I think we also have to and this is one of my big things I know but we have to demonstrate that we're a really diverse industry that we welcome people into this industry from across every form of group everybody who wants to come in should find an easy and comfortable way in the industry because if we don't we are going to lose out and we're not going to attract the talent in so i think as a professional body we have a real role a great role in a setting out how attractive an industry it is and we all know it is it's, you know what better is it than to build something can you walk away and go actually i made a contribution to that whether it's a bridge whether it's rail track everything we all contribute to communities we all make such a difference in what we build so how you get that excitement and that message over and then how we make sure that our qualifications and our competencies cover all of those new skills that are coming in so that we can maintain professional standards because i think that you made a really important point that technology is only as good as how we use it so that piece of stepping back and looking at what the numbers are that come out you know i have to say it's always been an issue ever since we've had excel spreadsheets you know i've, I've had stuff put in front of me where somebody's gone well it must be right because that's what that's what it said and i'm going yeah but i know if i add two and two i don't get five i get four so that cannot be right because <laughs> i can scan that line so you know we have to develop that encourage everyone in to be professional about what their output is to do the check to understand it and not just press the button as well, such it's a well, huge it's opportunity it's press. an opportunity but it's, it's a great i mean we, we look at it because we kind of focus on the struggle and the problems we've seen but the truth is we're not going to get rid of excel and do it by hand no. and for i think the younger people this is a huge opportunity because it gives them a chance to make a real difference which perhaps people in other generations did not have you know it was always innovation but perhaps more gradual now there's a change to use technology to make a really big difference and really change how things are being done yeah. and i'd like to think that will attract people because it's it, it is an opportunity for all those people who can use those new skills in an industry that traditionally did not use those skills. So perhaps the challenge is the same challenge it's always been differently framed, which is how do you get the new ideas and the fresh approach of the young that are the future, but also have enough of the experience of the more senior generation before them to rub off on them so that they, they, they get the benefit of that, those skills and experience to apply to some, to some new technology. Um, my next question, really, for Stephen is, well, presumably, you're not bothered about a skills gap because that's Matthew and Jim's problem, isn't it, no. to go building this stuff? No, I think I think I think that um, any progressive uh, stakeholder client um, will be keenly aware of demographics and the need. We're back to the, you know predict, uh, predictability, um, productivity, and stakeholder confidence. And if you're in that space um, of looking to deliver value for money in that arena, you can't ignore the challenges associated with the skills gap, demographics, and, and changing social references as well in terms of working patterns, work-life balance, all of, all of those things are moving parts that are important to any client or supplier, or indeed manufacturer, that is looking to kind of uh, enrich the nation through its GDP and investment through uh, construction. So it's a really, really pertinent issue. So, Matthew, if you, you, you probably have um, back at the office a, a secret top 10 of what the, the biggest challenges are moving forward for the business. Um, you can share them with us uh, offline later if you wish. <laughs> yep. But it is how, how high up that list of issues is a skills shortage and the need to also the need to upskill? Well, I think um, you know, there are some major pressures in terms of skills shortages in certain aspects of uh, engineering and construction in the UK right now, and actually technology and efficiency is one of the key answers to that. 
Um, we're bringing in different skills, there's different expertise now. Even you know, even the, even a road project now is digitalised. You know, there are systems in everything we deliver, and it's not now just about a civil engineering delivery. It's about a systems delivery. I think the ICE published a report, the systems approach to infrastructure delivery, that brings in systems thinking, agile project management, and a the theory called the V delivery model. And this is all about starting with the systems in mind. And uh, you're, th you're thinking about the systems before you start thinking about any other aspect of delivery. Um, so these, we, we are bringing in different skills and different expertise to do projects with different thinking and a different approach. Jim, do you, do you feel the same about upskilling and the skills gap? Or is that, uh, how big a challenge would you rate it? I think it's a big challenge and, and the, skill, the skill shortage is, is key. All these new systems require different skills so it's, and different to how we've been trained. So, it's a real big challenge to find the right people to deliver the assurance systems and the certified systems that we will have to do to sign these projects off. So and, and critical to successful projects. And, and critical, and I think you know, just building on recruitment and, and resource shortages, the apprenticeship, uh, which is like International Apprentice Week this week, mm -hmm. the, the, the apprenticeship scheme that, uh, that a lot of uh, companies have implemented has, has now sort of bearing fruit with, with the number of recruits that most companies have taken on. And, and it's through bringing the apprentices, probably from different backgrounds, that, that they bring their experiences from their from their sort of generation into PlayStation. Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah. But, the, but to help the projects develop technology and the experience that, that we need. Mm. Rudy, apart from the, the the key conceptual issues of, of risk and, and those type of things that we talked about. How do you feel about the, 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 the potential for technology to help the industry in the future? It's a fucking big question, isn't it? Uh, um, uh, the, well, it is, but we probably have uh, a few minutes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I think the, um, there's obviously, I mean, the potential is massive. I, I mean, I, I like your description of systems, um, Matthew, and I think there's a lot in there uh, that can be exploited. The, the, the difficulty is, is that if we look, for example, at BIM, now, BIM, government mandated BIM in 2011, and I have to say, I got all worked up about it, you know, this is going to transform the industry, and the government was saying, uh, um, that this is going to make a real difference, it's going to mean for early involvement, people are going to share data. But the trouble is, contrary to what a friend of mine, who was a professor of construction management at Reading years ago, who said, once we have the new technology in place and all the rest of it, once we get digitization, this is a long time ago now, is that will that will reform, complete reform, restructure the industry. It, and the trouble is that one of the things it's not an asset, but it might you could describe it as asset the industry, is its ability to refashion and reshape technology in its own image. Now what I mean by that is that if you look at when you say BIM, for example, has been digital collaborative tool. Has that revolutionised the, the, the industry? Well, one of the first things you saw, uh, well, the first thing that you saw with that was the reluctance of the industry to actually share data mm -hmm. uh, uh, in a common data environment. Uh, and um, so everybody uh, now keeps like you know you all want to keep things you know close to my chest because in fact um, and your system thing doesn't quite work with that. But it's not to say it's wrong, Matthew, it's absolutely right. But people want to keep things big because of the risk issues that, you know, are uh, Germans as well, early on. Um, uh, the other thing I, I would say to maximize sort of the technology, we've got to also think a lot about competence, haven't we? Uh, that's competent individuals and competent firms. Um, people who are going to be able to use the technology. I mean, the, the, the trouble is, at the moment, the, Probably not so much people who can't use it. The problem is people actually don't know how to evaluate its use. Mm -hmm. That's the problem. I, I'm, and you know, I am going to clue that whether what I'm using is going to help me or or hinder me. Um, I mean, and it's a bit like the old example, isn't it? The toaster with eight markings on it. But if you put on an eight, you'll burn the house down, won't you? Uh, um, I mean, it's the same with, with technology. You probably don't need number eight. Uh, um, uh, and it might cost you more if you did that. I mean, I'm, I've got a new TV coming, cutting edge, it's supposed to be. Um, it, but it's going to cost £400 to, to actually install. I don't pay £400 to install a TV. 
Um, so it might, add, it might add cost. So it's, it's, a, it's judicious use Indeed. of gently by competency. Somewhere in your village is a teenager who would do that for mm. £10. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely, absolutely, absolutely certain of that fact. I will look for that person when I get back home. <laughs> <laughs> another tip I want. It's really interesting what we're saying around this table, and there's a group of us who all of whom are sitting here going, talking about technology and going that we're maybe um, of an older generation, I think somebody said Luddites around technology, and actually, and then we wonder why it's taken a long time to adapt to it. You know, it is going to take time. I actually don't think that it's but 10 years from when the government mandated BIM to be introduced to now isn't very long in terms of changing things. So I think that we have to really accept that it's here and then give it time to embrace it and to accept that we need lessons learned around all of these projects. Um, with, with tending to, I think, I think we have a, a danger that we don't develop this opportunity because it's hard and we don't understand it. So it's back to bringing those people in who do and respecting their views and actually just stepping back slightly for those of us and I definitely, definitely include myself, I still can't use our TV um, stepping back and going actually, I don't know I'm being willing to say I don't know and respect them well, 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 I agree and I was going to respond to you Mark when you said of course all this young but bringing in the experience of the people who've been around but, and I was thinking you know what maybe that's a blocker because People will come with some very clever probably ideas. Not, probably not a blocker to generate lots of work for you and I. <laughs> <laughs> well, put it there to one side. We, we'll have people come up with clever ideas, and I think perhaps because we don't understand it, we'll be very cautious and put the brakes on it. And in some ways, like I said, it, it is, we talk about evolution or revolution, there may be some revolutions. And when you do stuff on site, and when you do it through a smart contract or whatever, we need, and perhaps with some pilot studies, trying to say, you know what, we're not going to kind of do it halfway, a bit of new stuff, but keeping in the old stuff because they give us the comfort that we need. But so you know what, you go, you come up with whatever you think is the best way to do it, we're not going to interfere and see how it works. I think, I think that there's an awful lot in there, because with respect, I think we've been, we've been oscillating between macro and micro, yeah. okay? And, and I think that, that there are two things, uh, picking up on what you said earlier, Shai, and what you, you and, and uh, Rudy have said. Um, it's culture and it's capability. So the cultural aspect around embracing digitization is a leadership issue. And leadership is about asking the right questions and, and doing the right things. It's not about them being done right, that is management, and it's not about the expertise which comes from practitioners and their application and use of apps and systems and whatnot. So the leadership quotient, I don't, I don't need to know how the mechanics of an IT opportunity work. What I need is to make an informed decision that if you do something this way and you support its deployment, it'll give you these benefits. And how do I how do I then assess the risk of, of deployment? Mm -hmm. so, so there's a cultural thing. And the other thing I wanted to say around culture, culture is you're absolutely right, is one of the inhibitors is data. Data is a commodity, right? And the richer and the cleaner the data, the more valuable that commodity. And in different sectors, it's treated in different ways. And as long as you have a common language that means that you're looking at like for like as you amass that data, then it's the influence of government departments or leaders or whatnot to go the degree to which they're prepared to be altruistic and share that data. And their disposition to that will be different in different sectors. And if you're a, if you're a private organization looking to compete, you're going to want to hold your data like this and try to create an environment where you see the bigger picture and how you can share whether that data is cost data, program data, liabilities, whatever. It, it is a challenge. There are other levers to pull in other sectors. And in terms of in terms of competency, I wanted to. There's a rich vein of discussion around procurement, uh, and I think you're absolutely right. And, and I will be uh, I will be remarkably succinct. If you look at what happened to mainstream construction in the 60s and 70s, as the emergence of heating and ventilation systems and IT systems put in uh, raised floors and suspended ceilings, it created it, it created a whole new subsector around heating and ventilation. Bespoke market, bespoke contract, bespoke expertise in procuring and managing HMV installation. 
the equivalent now is where we are and where we've been for a while around digital. You look at major infrastructure, a significant element of, of the investment is on systems and on digital capability. But what we don't have is a competence and an expertise in the procurement of and that's uh, dealing with the liabilities of those things in that sector. And there's an interesting thing that I believe has happened, whereas the emergence of the digital sector co-opted lots of the labels that were established in the construction sector. And if you look at how they define where they are in design, development, and implementation, there are lots of the similar labels. But what the construction sector hasn't yet done, and, and the there's, a, there's, there's, a, there's a call to professional institutions, not just CICS, and, but the RICS and others, to think in terms of how do they equip their practitioners to understand the digital market when it comes to procurement, liabilities, and holding people to account to deliver on program, and indeed understanding how you value what you've got. It doesn't meet functional expectations. And so there's a whole gap there around the competency and expertise from a construction perspective in systems procurement, particularly digital systems. If, if you're just doing price, if you're looking at tier one contractors price, that doesn't give you any insight into or any ability to evaluate you know, what the systems engineering that goes behind, as you described. And, and, and you're right, I, I totally agree with you, that's a procurement thing. But while we're doing tier one contractor price, uh, price-led procurement, then we're not going to get to what you're talking about, and which I quite agree with you. I think we, we've probably come to the, uh, probably some, a little past our, our intended allotted time. Um, my, uh, I'll share with you one brief, uh, just because I can, uh, experience I had with technology um, recently. Um, I was at a venue that had a toaster, which had, you could choose the shade of brown on, because it was a, a toast color detecting technology toaster smart. and it had a sticker, it, a smart toaster, it was Bluetooth and you could actually set on an app on your phone the colour of your toast. It had a sticker on it and the sticker said use on setting two and check every minute. That was what the sticker said. It was a very expensive toaster. I also know someone, uh, in fact one of my parents actually bought a toaster a few months ago from a very cheap supermarket for less than £10 which has a glass panel on the side. And you can actually see how brown your toast is, press the button at the right time. So my, 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 point. my thought, until, well, I'm, I'm, to be honest, I'm going to probably buy you one. Um, <laughs> <It's an innovation. laughs> I'm, 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 going to, I'm going to get it delivered because perhaps one of the points that, that sums up that is, is that we want to make things simple and better and technology can have a big role in that, but it has to be tempered in the context of achieving best value, in, and that can mean all, all sorts of things. One thing I've learned today is technology is such a big topic, we need our own session on it. Uh, for now, I'd just like to thank everyone who's tuned in today to watch this session. There'll be a number of sessions coming up in the future. Underneath uh, me at the moment will appear an email address that you can email to any topics in the future that you'd like to see our panels discuss. And also, if you're interested in getting involved, please drop us a line. But in the meantime, thank you very much.